All right. Okay, everyone, welcome to Side Talk. So tonight I have Dana Golden. Um, Dana is a certified recovery coach and a certified family addiction coach. And I have David Marion, and he is um, the lead leading addiction interventionist and sober coach. So um, welcome to the Side Talk podcast, guys. Um, I'm really happy to have you here tonight. We're very right. excited to be here and have a good conversation with you. Yeah, absolutely. So where did you two meet? Oh, boy. Um, well, we used to be married. So, uh, yeah, we are our ex-spouses. We met in Minnesota. I had come to Minnesota from California, and David had come to Minnesota from New York. So we kind of say we met in the middle and uh, had a whirlwind romance and uh, got married nine months to the day after we met. And we were married for 12 years um, due to addictions um, that David was dealing with. Uh, we ended up getting divorced and uh, David suffered some severe consequences from his addictions, which I'm sure you'll go into. And uh, when he was done suffering his consequences and was sober, we decided we had a story to tell and we could help other families. So we came back together. We wrote a book together called Addiction Rescue, The No BS Guide to Recovery. And our mission is to help families um, that are dealing with a loved one with a substance use or alcohol use disorder or somebody suffering in themselves. So do you guys feel like you're better as like friends or do you ever feel like oh maybe this we can try again or that's like no we're just friends we're good friends oh hell no <laughs> uh, we do what we do fine like this this is how the relationship is um transformed you know dana's got her life i've got mine but we are connected through business and two daughters that we have oh that's so cool i love it all right. So let's talk a little bit about the addiction, David. What what were you addicted to, if you don't mind sharing? If you don't want to share, it's fine, but it's up to you. Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> I was addicted to anything that made me feel good, from oh. opioids to quaaludes to two and all, second alls, cocaine, heroin, prescription meds, Tic Tacs, um, you name it. Oh my gosh. And Dana, you didn't have an addiction, right? That's correct. Yeah. I was always on the other side of addiction, taking care of and being there for and trying to fix and, you know, wondering what was wrong with me that I couldn't help them get better and had all the issues that the people that are on the other side of addiction with a loved one has. Wow. That must have been really hard. So, um, David, when did you realize that, okay, I have an issue here? Um, did you always know, like, when you were doing it that you had an issue or you didn't realize that it was really a problem until something significant happened? Well, define issue, right? <laughs> we all have issues in life. When does it really become a problem? Yeah. You know, it, it, when you begin to... Um, this self-destructive behavior is becoming the number one thing in your life and you're putting everything else on hold so you could take care of your addiction. That's when I really knew it was a problem. I knew at a very young age though, I liked the way it made me feel when I drank or did drugs, um, kind of put me into that numbness state that I didn't have to deal in reality. And I love that euphoria feeling. And I chased it for a long time until it ended up uh, kicking me in the butt. Wow. So what was the defining moment for you where you actually said, okay, I'm going to get help. That's it. I'm done with this life. Well, the first time and my family intervened on me, I was working on Wall Street and um, they said, I'm drinking and doing too much cocaine. I said, you guys aren't drinking enough. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, this is the 80s. Life is fun. Yeah. And I ended up going to treatment in Minnesota. And that was the first time. The second time was just the, all these consequences started piling up in my life. I was getting divorced. I was uh, ended up bankrupting this multi-million dollar brokerage firm that I had, uh, that we had built. And um, I ended up getting um, indicted for mail fraud and um, money laundering. And I was looking at 
five years in federal prison. Yikes. So is is that a hard case to to beat? Because there's a lot of people that are going through that right now. And I always wonder, is that like really hard to beat or you can beat something like that? Beat the feds or beat the addiction? <laughs> beat the feds. You don't beat the feds. You <laughs> plead the feds. Okay. <laughs> All right. yeah, very difficult. Um, you know, when an indictment comes back and it says United States attorney versus your name uh, or United States of America versus your name, you're like, uh, there's a lot of people out there against me here. I'm going to have a hard time beating them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. So what do you think worked to get you to the place where you are today? Like, what do you think worked in your recovery? I think it's the constant maintenance of every day getting up and doing the same thing over and over and the repetition of change, you know, not hanging out in the places that I were, um, not having these same, um, going to the same events, hanging out with the same people, you know, it's really changing so much about yourself. It's taking a look and really digging in and saying, why am I doing this, right? What is it that keeps bringing me back to this thing? Yeah. What is it that I'm missing that I haven't dealt with in life? Okay. So Dana and David um, have, they're entrepreneurs um, and they have this um, company called the Recovery Coach, right? The Life Recovery Coach. Um, and through this organization, they help people. So Dana, for you, what made you want to get involved with something like this after living on, you know, the side of the caretaker and just watching David, you know, kind of be self-destructive? Like, what made you say, oh, I want to help people? Because there's so, so many um, mistakes and myths that family members do around their loved one that has an addiction. And I feel it's very important for them to understand that they're not doing it to hurt you. They're not doing it because this is what they want to be doing. They're not doing it because they're just a bad person with bad character and bad values, right? Addiction takes a hold of someone and they don't have a choice. And it uh, really changes the brain. Any substance that you use continually starts to change the brain. And when the brain starts changing and those neuropathways get deeper and deeper, it really becomes quite impossible to just have willpower to work against it. So the first thing I try to teach family members is you have to learn to separate your loved one from the disease of addiction. And your loved one is not identified by this addiction. And I teach them that you have to have empathy and compassion, even some, though that's sometimes so hard to do when you feel someone's coming at you and hurting you so much. But you can't take it personally. They're not doing it to you personally. And the other thing I teach family members that's so important for them to understand is that their recovery and them getting better and them living for themselves and for them to stop running their lives ragged around this addicted person in their life is to get in their own recovery. Their recovery is not dependent on their loved ones getting in recovery. But once they do get in recovery, it's a lot more likely that if they change the role, that their loved one will also change, right? If you don't change, nothing changes. So that's what became important to me to help family members understand what it's like for the addict and their role in it. Okay. And I think that does really make sense because like you lived on the other side of it. So a lot of people who do have addictions, there's this whole family, you know, that's sitting there waiting for them to get better. And I think that, that it's great that you have lived through it. So you can kind of really shepherd them through that experience and help them to, you know, wrap their head around everything. Yeah. So, and, that's, yeah. As I said, and that's why David's so great working with the addicts because he has that experience, you know, he can say, I've been there. I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like, you know, I don't have that perspective to help those people, but I do with the families. Yeah, for sure. So David, what, um, what made you, say, okay, this is something that I want to do, because I would think that after, you know, going through all the things you went through, you'd be like exhausted and kind of want to just, you know, live a quiet life and mind your business. But now you're helping people who are struggling through their own addictions. What really made you feel connected to doing this? I think I have an understanding where I truly get it. 
what other people don't get. And, um, you know, you really can't recover until you know what you're recovering from, yeah. right? So until we break it down to the simplicity of what is and what's not recovery, many people out there, these treatment centers, I don't know what the heck's going on out there, um, but they're not getting the message to them, which is another conversation. Most treatment centers stay in business because people relapse. If everyone got the message the first time, they'd probably be out of business, right? right. That's unfortunate. And I think that I have a way of relating to other people. I see the isolation, the loneliness, being withdrawn. I see the pain. Um, I see social anxiety. I see, um, you know, an egotistical maniac with these inferiority complexes. And I know how to relate to them because that's who I was. You know, I didn't use because my life was so great. I used because I had a limited self-belief that didn't feel good about myself that when I used, it made me feel better about me. I thought other people might have liked me more. So I can identify with that, with them. Yeah, for sure. So Dana, when someone com contacts your facility, um, like what is the process? What happens? Well, the first thing we do is an assessment. Um, you know, find out who they're calling about, if it's themselves or a loved one. Um, often the calls we get are for interventions. Like David always says, we're not the first call, we're usually the last call. Um, and then we just do an assessment of what's going on, how long has it been going on. Um, uh, if we're going to do an intervention, uh, David's the one that he has connections all over the country with tr different treatment centers uh, for different people. Everybody has their own, you know, way of uh, getting recovered and David's really good at identifying what facility is going to be best and what and with each client so he secures a bed for them we move in on the intervention uh, we meet with the loved ones and uh, David does a pre-intervention and then the intervention usually the next day and uh, David has a really good batting average of getting his clients right from the intervention to the treatment center and then there's ongoing coaching. So uh, we always say that while their loved ones away for 30 or 45 days in treatment, it's really the time that the family has to kind of get their act together. Because if that loved one comes back into the same environment, it's just a recipe for relapse. So they really have to learn to place boundaries, set up different roles for themselves, learn their behaviors. They're keeping the family dynamic sick and work their way out of that in those 30 days. So I kind of take on the families, work with them. And then once they're, uh, their loved one's home out of recovery, David typically will take them on as a client and work with them because you know, recovery is a lifelong process. It's a practice, like David said, on a day-to-day -day basis. Just like you get up and you might meditate every morning, you might work out every morning, you might have a cup of coffee every morning, whatever it is. I mean, you really have to focus that your recovery is an everyday event too. So um, we uh, like to, you know, add in those coaching packages just to uh, keep them on track for a while. And then we give them the resources, uh, whether it's meetings or other therapists or psychologists or counselors, you know, I mean, there just needs to be ongoing aftercare. So we help them set all that up and put that in place as well. Okay. And people can call from anywhere in the country to um, get your assistance? Anywhere absolutely. in the world. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Anywhere in the world. Yeah. Nice. So, um, Tell, I want you to both tell me something that you think people don't know about most people with substance abuse issues. I think that they're really good people with a bad disease. You know, this addiction is, uh, it just, a, we call it an equal opportunity destroyer, right? It doesn't matter our size, our shape, our uh, religion, our tax bracket. It affects all types of people. Um, we need to see the human in front of us, not the problem. And I think that many people are stigmatizing the problem of addiction rather than seeing the person in there willing to help them. For you, Luna, what do you think? Yeah, so I would say that the biggest myth around it is that the loved ones of an addict have to, um, you know, there's all kinds of terms for it, you know, tough love or, um, you, I don't know the other, I'm, I'm not coming up with the other terms for it, but that tough love, you know, and you got to be, you know, mean and harsh and, and it's just not like that. I mean, it's like, you got to love them. You got to listen to them. You can never give up on them. Um, you know, they need you in a way 
that you're not used to hearing because you're so resentful and so angry and you want to push back so hard. Um, and that's just something I want people to understand that that's not the answer. Yeah. So Zaina and David wrote a book, guys. It's called Addiction, The No BS Guide to Recovery Rescue. And um, I want you guys to tell us who is this book for and what do you want people to learn from this book? Like, what will they take from it? Well, the book Addiction Rescue is really for anybody that's curious if there's a problem in their life with some kind of addiction, if a loved one's curious if there's something going on, because it really explains from the ground up the definition of addiction, what to look for, the signs, what addiction um, requires of a person. And then it goes into um, our five-step process into getting into recovery and staying there. And then it has lists at the back of all the trigger warning signs to relapse. It has um, how to get rid of obsessive thinking. Um, it's just a really comprehensive book, um, how to recover in body, mind, and spirit, because addiction does ruin all three areas of life. And so for anybody that's wanting to understand their loved one that doesn't understand addiction, it's a great book. And for anybody that's struggling, that wants to get in recovery and know how to stay there, it's great for them as well. Nice. So um, let's say you have someone in your life that you feel might have an addiction problem. What would you guys, what tips would you give for them to try to, you know, get the person help or even, you know, approach the topic? Well, it's usually a tough topic that many who are struggling with addiction will not talk about, mm -hmm. right? They're going to point the finger. They're going to blame. They're going to use every rationalization and justification not to talk about this. And they're going to constantly deflect it. So when their loved one begins to talk about it, they keep deflecting the topic. How do we talk about it? We say we're recognizing some behaviors that are different lately. Some of the signs that we're seeing, you know, you're not as kept as you were. Your, your, um, your mannerisms are different. You're short. Your speech is slurred. I'm noticing something. Your eyes might be a little more diluted than... Um, and I'm worried, is there something going on that we could talk about? And I want you to know that this is a safe place to talk about it. Do you need help? Right? Those are the questions that people don't want to ask. Do you need help? Mm -hmm. Because if you do need help, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get you the help necessary. Because I know this is happening. And usually when there's addiction running rampant, I often say it's like walking around with your fly open. Everyone sees it but you. Right? Yeah. And that's usually when it happens too late. And that's when the family usually intervenes or does something. And, um, you know, we're trying to save them these consequences. Sometimes, you know, hitting bottom doesn't necessarily mean you have to um, hit six feet below the ground. You know, mm -hmm. many people die from this and many people end up in jails and institutionalized. And we're offering them the path of recovery. But people don't understand that when you're struggling with this, you don't see an out. You don't see how can I help myself in a situation like this? You can't. That's why you need to ask for help. Absolutely. Dana, what do you think um, some tips are, you know, as someone on the outside who, you know, watched your husband go through this, what would you say is a good way to approach the topic? Um, I agree with everything David just said. Um, it often is the family can't talk about it because they've talked about it so much, right? That they've pushed and pushed and pushed. And that's where it really comes in to help have somebody, uh, an outsider come in and talk to the person. The family's too close, they're too emotional. Uh, so that's why we always recommend just having a conversation with someone, you know, uh, is there someone we can direct you to? Uh, somebody that you could talk about it if you don't feel comfortable talking to your family about it, um, whether it's a coach or a therapist, or um, like David said, when you're noticing these behaviors, their grades, their work is suffering, their friends are changing, um, to have a conversation and say, uh, we're noticing these things, and how can we be supportive to you yeah. to get you back on track? Okay. All right, so David, you are the leading addiction interventionist, right? So have you ever had an intervention go left on you? And if you have, were you able to get it under control? And what would you say to people at home who are not lead interventionists about 
you know, like putting together an intervention, because, you know, sometimes people will say, maybe, maybe we should have an intervention, you know, and approach our friend or something like that. What would you say to that? Call a professional. <laughs> because anytime a family tries to intervene, it usually goes awry. Yeah. Because they don't have any structure, any format. Um, and yes, I've had many interventionists, interventions that have taken a while before they've gone to treatment. Mm -hmm. Right, they didn't be so. They weren't so responsive after the letters were read. They resisted. They fought. They said, "I don't have a problem. I'm not going. I'm not going anywhere. I don't need help. You people need help." Seven hours later, they're in the front seat with me going to treatment <laughs> because there's this. We call it, you know, the anger, the resentment that they have, the fear, the anxiety of changing their life. We got to remove all that during the intervention process because what lies below that is submission and surrender. Yeah. So it just takes a while to get there because people don't wake up and say, wow, what a great day for an intervention. This is going to be lovely. But when the family comes around and sees this and they are reading specific letters that are, I have edited and made suggestions towards, it's not done through an attack, an ambush, an assault. It's done through the love, care, and support to help your loved one heal from what they're dealing with. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, not, I don't know if I've had, well, maybe a couple that people say after, you know, the intervention, all right, let me go pack my stuff and I'm going ahead to treatment. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of objections, a lot of objections that they put up and those are the walls of resistance, right? Yeah, it's a very sensitive topic and, you know, I appreciate you guys coming on and sharing these amazing tips because I think they're great. Um, I want you guys to also share an oh hell yes moment. An oh hell yes moment is a moment of clarity. So I know we probably have a lot of oh hell yes moments in different times of our lives, right? So I want you to share a moment where you felt either successful personally or just like things were clear and you knew exactly what you needed to do. And just tell us a little bit about that moment. So Dana, ladies first. Sure, I would say that uh, in conjunction with what I'm doing now, um, and I, when I was with uh, working with David, really just as the administrative assistant doing the contracts and the travel arrangements and whatnot, and I was talking to these families that would call in to intervene on their loved ones, and I'm talking to them on a ledge, right, because they're so fearful and they're ridden with anxiety and they don't know what to expect, and so I'm having these conversations, and it was like, oh, hell yes, I should be a coach because I'm coaching them anyway. And I, you know, and I enjoy it. I've been there. I can relate to them. And, and, and I told David, I said, I'm getting my coach. I'm going to coach these families. You know, it was like, duh. So that was my, oh, hell yes moment. Oh, I love it. Thank you for sharing that. David, mm -hmm. what about you? Uh, I mean, I have so many of them, you know, I really do. Um, anytime I intervene on somebody, and I get to take this person cross country with me and fly with them. Um, you have one of these moments of, oh, hell no, are you kidding me? This guy is willing to change his life. He watching the resistance three, four hours ago where he's threatening everyone in his household to get the hell out of his life, he doesn't care, to this spiritual shift and transformation that all of a sudden he's committed to the next step of his recovery. It's a moment that's just mind boggling to see that transformation that is, uh, yeah, it's one of those, oh, hell no moments. Are you kidding me? I can't believe that what we just witnessed in the last hour. It's crazy. Yeah, that's your oh, hell no moment is when you're like, seeing this, but then you feel, oh, hell yes, when you realize that you help this person get to that transition, right? Oh, the hell yes is just when you drop them off and you know yeah. that they're so glad to be in a safe place that they always usually, people say this to me on the way, you know, I really needed this. Wow. I'm glad that this was done. I mean, I can't tell you the percentage of people that say it. And they know once the family comes there, there's an intervention. It's not, you know, a yeah. surprise party. Uh, kind of like when the DEA comes to your house, they don't knock on the door and say, is everyone dressed? We're going to be going through your stuff. They kick the door down and say, welcome. 
You know, it's the same thing here. And, um, you know, it is a oh, hell yes moment when they do accept it and they say, yes, I need help and I will go to treatment. I love it. Well, guys, it was so much fun talking to you today. I really love your energy, David, and you too, Dana. I love that your story of how you fell into your coaching, you know, position. Um, And I really appreciate you guys. So tell everyone where they can connect with you and where they can, you know, log on to your organization and find things about, find information about your facility and what you offer. Yeah, so it's theliferecoverycoach.com. If you want to send an email, it's info at theliferecoverycoach.com. It's got all, all the information on our website. Um, uh, we're both on LinkedIn. You know, we have social media stuff, but that, that's really, you know, we'll talk to anybody. You can book in a call. Um, phone numbers are on the website. And we're happy to, you know, help anybody that's just questioning, wondering what they can do. You know, I do want to say really quick that, um, you know, oftentimes we hear, you know, what's the right time to intervene on our loved one? You know, how, how do we know? And I, I think this helps put it in perspective. If somebody had diabetes or cancer, you wouldn't wait to get treatment for them. You get them to the doctor right away. It's the only disease out there where people are waiting and wondering, do we help them or not? I mean, any other disease, you're going to go get the help you need. So please call us because there's help that available and it's, we're a great resource. We can send you in the right direction, whatever that might be. So we really encourage people to reach out. Yes. And where can we buy the book? Anywhere books are sold. Amazon.com. Yep. Um, well, Amazon, it's called Addiction Rescue, the No BS Guide to Recovery. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. So thank you. <laughs> thank you Absolutely. So much for us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, guys, this was great. Thank you so much.